All right, everyone. Welcome back for those that were on earlier and for anybody new, thanks for joining. Uh, we're going to take some time now. The last session today will be around club administration and, and probably a few other things because uh, we have our, our speaker here today is, is the AI president, Kevin Bolger. So, um, so he's got lots of information to share and, and uh, certainly answer any questions if you have them uh, along the way. Go ahead and ask. If not, throw them in chat. We'll make sure we get to them. And uh, without further ado, I'll uh, turn it over to Kevin, all yours. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate it. Uh, Gretchen, can we go to the next slide? Okay. Um, well, thanks for everybody for coming in, especially at this late hour. I, I guarantee you we'll be done by 1030. Uh, so, you know, you don't have to worry about setting an alarm or anything. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is thank you all for participating in this. And thank you all for what you do on a uh, yearly basis, being presidents and members of your different clubs, coaching. Uh, nothing happens in hockey without the volunteers and without your hard work. And as you know, we had a annual Congress uh, in, um, it wasn't in Colorado. Well, it wasn't Colorado, but not for us. We were all zooming in. And it's the USA Hockey Annual Meeting. Now, we kind of have a, a little bit of a recap on that. We've had some um, a change of uh, at the helm. Jim Smith decided not to run for president and did not renew his term. And there was two uh, young, uh, two gentlemen that ran for president. And Mike Tromboli from New York uh, became the new president of USA Hockey. Uh, Digger Phelps, who was the who preceded Jim Smith as president was chairman of the board, he stepped down and went to emeritus status. Jim Smith became president. They voted him in as president emeritus. J.J. Uh, O'Connor uh, resigned as the uh, uh, his role on the board, USA Hockey Board uh, for Handicapped Hockey, and he is now a board member emeritus. And uh, Bob Matson, Matson, who uh, is was in charge of the high school program for USA Hockey and a USA Hockey board member uh, retired as well. And he became board member emeritus. Uh, we also have uh, new appointees. Uh, Kendall Coyne was made uh, athlete director from the Central District. And Amy LaPole, who is now residing in Texas, but who spent uh, years and years up here on the AHI board and working on disabled hockey in Illinois, um, has now become the chairperson succeeding J.J. O'Connor as disabled section uh, chair. So we're very proud of these folks. We look forward to working with Mike Tromboli. Most of you probably do not know him. I was fortunate enough to be involved with him this past year uh, on a number of things. And he's got his head screwed on straight. He's extremely accessible. He's done everything from coaching to be on the board. As a matter of fact, we would be on calls at 9.30 at night, 10.30 his time. And he'd say, you know, I, I got to get these guys out of the rink. You know, we've got to, I got to send them home. They got homework to do. So he's still coaching. He still loves the game. And um, I think he will be a tremendous asset to USA Hockey. Uh, I, I believe that we're moving forward in a very positive direction. I say to everybody, give them a chance, and I think we're going to go and do great things together. Uh, next slide. These are rule changes. And before everybody goes crazy, uh, let me explain how this works. Every four years now, there's rule changes, and they're voted on at USA Hockey. Illinois is part of what they call the Central District of USA Hockey, and they're comprised of Illinois and three other districts. We have meetings, we have central district meetings and central district president's meetings, and we discuss all these things. The first thing that I'd like to talk about is the length of the penalties. And we have that up on the slide and you can see that. And, and, and this, I don't know, I guess we could say in some cases it's good, in some cases it's bad. Um, you know, if we have a period of 
12 minutes or less. The kid's not going to be in the box for a minute and 30 seconds on a minor. They dropped it down to a minute. If it's a 12 to 17 minute period, 130 on a minor. If it's 17 and over, it's two minutes, just like it has been. Um, this we kind of thought was a change for the better. Central District, Illinois included, was in support of this modification uh, rule. And in red, you can see down there where you know, they think it's better at the age, younger age groups and gives them more ice time and the kid doesn't lose a shift and so on and so forth. The next one, I'm going to be very honest with you, not a soul from Central District. Uh, and we have our reps that actually cast vote for us, just like we would be in Congress. None of us supported this rule. Yet, it passed. And it passed, it's got to be, it came out of what they call USA Hockey Youth Council. And there's a representative of all over the United States. And they decided that this would be a good rule to implement. It uh, passed Youth Council uh, 64 by uh, a vote of 64 percent. So it was a close vote. Central District, the entire district, all four reps voted against this. The reasoning for this is that they think it's a developmental rule. It, it, it takes away the tag up from the older uh, levels and it becomes instant offsides. Um, their rationale is, is that it creates more skills and so on and so forth. Our argument is, is that it might be beneficial at the might and sport level, but beyond that, they all get it. And all this does is slow the game down. Tag up, which was much better, we thought. Tag up, the, the kids knew right away to get out of the zone before the whistle would blow. And if they weren't advancing towards the puck, they could tag up and, and, and the whistle stayed in the rest pocket and the game continued and it made for a better game. And it also, in our opinion, helped the defense uh, players get the skate the ice, uh, the puck out of the ice or pass it out, do a breakout. Uh, but obviously we were not the winners on this. And again, it, it was a pretty close vote. I don't have the stats but this is our rule for the next four years. A lot of people have called us and said to us, do we have to follow this? The answer is yes. It's in the USA Hockey rule book that will be coming out. The refs will be told to enforce it and we have to abide by it. Uh, and I don't know of anybody in Illinois and I don't mean to be speaking for any of you, but I would assume, and I hope correctly so, that most people really aren't tickled with this, but we're stuck with it for the next four years. The next one is shorthanded icing. And this is a situation that uh, we fought, again, probably for the past 12 years. It's come up every time there's a rule change and every time we opposed it, and unfortunately, um, it's now passed. So they're really, what it amounts to is there's no icing anymore. Uh, it'll be called, I mean, it, you can't ice the puck during a penalty kill unless you're in high school or adult league. So if you do, the whistle will blow and the puck uh, will come back down into your zone and you will wind up uh, having to have a face-off in your zone. Uh, the problem is, is uh, you can't kill off a penalty. Uh, they think it's better for the development of the kids because they will figure out a way to control the puck in their zone and get it out of their zone or dump it into the neutral zone or whatever it is. But it's, it's discouraging just taking the puck and throwing it away, which is what everybody's doing since I started many, many years ago. Uh, this is what the pros do. This is what our kids think they should do. But now it's changed. So when they kill off a penalty, 
they are going to kill it off by skating the puck out of their zone, passing it out of their zone, or like some of the more enlightened coaches said, what we have to do now is teach them to dump it into the neutral zone and get it out of the zone that way. And um, this is my, it may be helped by the instant offsides because if anybody on the um, advancing team gets too excited, they may um, come in and, and they can't do a tag up anymore. So maybe that's one way of getting us to accept the instant offsides. Uh, again, just like the other calls, we're stuck with them for four years. I'm sure four years from now, they will come up again. Uh, I'm sure USA Hockey will spend four years evaluating them and seeing if it has made any changes or any uh, skill advancement among the kids. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if four years from now, they didn't change it back. But I'm not the guy that uh, gets to say so. Just so you know it, Illinois and the other three members of Central District voted against this rule as well. But now it is a USA hockey rule. The rest will enforce it, and we have to coach it. High school is the only uh, unit that is exempt from it, and adults, of course. So next slide, Gretchen, please. Okay. We've had some changes. <clears throat> we had our annual meeting, and despite the uh, difficulties with the election process, uh, thanks to Laura Johnson, uh, everybody that wanted to vote was able to vote. And uh, the four incumbents, there were five incumbents running, four out of the five won, and they wound up uh, being re-elected for another three-year term. That's Gino Cavallini, Greg Chudikoff, Anita Lichterman, and Kerry Zach. Uh, Paul Jakubowski did not, was not retained. And uh, Bob Apter, who is, as many of you know, president of Nihil, uh, won that spot, and he is now a board member. Uh, Melissa Surrett, who is the president of the Hawks, lost by 26 votes. Um, the asterisk next to her name is she was appointed to fill a board vacancy. For the past year, I have had a, I guess what you call a pocket appointment. If somebody resigns from the board, the president has the uh, good fortune, I guess, if you wanna call it, of being able to select the person that he or she wants to put on the board. I spent almost a year interviewing candidates and uh, receiving suggestions from other people and many, many well-qualified individuals were brought before me and suggested to fill the vacancy. Uh, the choice was not a board choice, it was my choice. I really did not know Melissa. I heard many, many good things about her. Um, we met last week and Melissa uh, dazzled me. I thought she was just tremendous. And I appointed her to the board. She will be a welcome member of the board. She is going to be the, uh, a member of the Rules and Ethics Committee. Her legal background certainly will help her uh, and help that committee. And she is now going to be the head of the, she's gonna be Illinois Safe Sport representative, uh, which is a, 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 an important job where anything that comes up that appears to qualify under the guidelines of Safe Sport, Melissa will have to write it up and send it to uh, USA Hockey and the Safe Sport Committee and uh, they will make a determination whether they're going to handle it nationally and through safe sport, or as they often do, they'll refer it back to the affiliate and uh, rules and ethics will then take over the investigation. Uh, so I hope that answers many questions. People were asking how did the, this happen and who does it or whatever. Uh, she was one of the many, many candidates that I interviewed for the spot and, um, she impressed me the most. So 
she received the appointment. Um, the, the five that won the election, they are board members for the next three years, unless they resign. Um, Melissa fills a spot that was vacated by Mike Barrett. So she is the unfortunate, um, she gets to run for retention in two years uh, with me and several other people. So, and anyway, welcome to all these folks aboard. We're very excited about having some new blood on the board and uh, we always welcome that. And we encourage others that may be interested in becoming board members if they're insane enough to wanna to do that. Um, we'd like you to volunteer, uh, get on our committees. We have a, a ton of committees. We have 50, 60 people that are not board members that are on these various committees and they volunteer and some of them stay volunteers for 20 years and never go outside of a committee. Others do so and, and, and like it and, and learn about AHI and, and then want to be on the board. Most of us that are on the board now came up through that system where we were on committees. Uh, I, I was not, I was kind of recruited to, to fill the vacancy actually. And the, the president at the time, Bob Matson, appointed me and put me on a committee. But uh, the other board members, most of them had paid their dues by going through different committees. And uh, uh, it, it's really great. And I really encourage it. Even if you don't have any aspirations for being an AHI board member, please feel free to participate in the various committees. And uh, you're always welcome to apply. We look forward to it. Next slide, please. Okay, now this I thought was really cool. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever had the opportunity to read our rules and regulations and bylaws. Um, I'm an attorney and I read them and walked away confused. Uh, we have for years wanted to revise them. We've attempted to do it. And uh, it, it finally, we, we, we got some pointers from uh, a law firm that was defending us on the federal cases. And uh, we got some pointers from USA Hockey. But really, uh, Laura and Alita, Anita Lichterman sat down and, and each of the, the various committee directors and chairs uh, did their part in rewriting them. And then Laura, and Anita organized them, put them together in a system that made sense in a language that was English and not mumbo jumbo, legal mumbo jumbo. And we really are proud of it. I hope you guys can uh, be proud of it and utilize them as well. And you can find these uh, on our newly designed website. Gretchen and JJ O'Connor did that. And uh, the one show is on the, um, the uh, sorry, I had a call coming. Uh, the one is on the third tab on the top of the navigation bar, uh, rules and regs. And the other one is the first button uh, at the bottom of our homepage. You can see AI rules and regs there. Uh, feel free to screenshot this, keep it. We have extra, you know, we can always send you the information if you need it. But I really suggest, especially the club presidents, familiarize yourself with the rules and regs. And uh, I can tell you another thing, a, a little advice as a former club president, the people that oftentimes are caught up in this and wind up having problems because of it are your volunteer team managers. They are picked, they volunteer, they do the legwork and the heavy lifting for your various teams. A lot of them rely on the coaches to know the rules and regulations. The problem that we often have, and I don't mean any disrespect to any coaches on board, coaches read, maybe read the rule book 15, 20 years ago. They do think that they have every rule and reg for not only Illinois, but USA Hockey and the NHL firmly imprinted in their mind. The managers rely on that. And unfortunately, when something bad happens, 
we find out that the coaches were completely wrong, had no idea what was going on. And the person that takes the fall for the team and looks bad is the poor manager that's just trying to do their best. Oftentimes, they're moms that never played the game or dads that never played the game. I used to ask AHI to give us extra copies of the USA Hockey and AHI rules. And now you can get them online, both at USA and AHI. And I suggested that our managers read these and familiarize themselves with them so that they can save not only themselves and their organization, but also their coaches. I think it's the greatest tool that AHI and USA Hockey put out. And uh, please use them. Please stress the importance of them to your managers and your coaches and uh, bring them up to date on it. It's really a good tool and it'll save you a lot of problems down the road. Okay, Gretchen, what do we got next here? Oh, one of my favorites. As president, I had to relinquish my committee duties. And one of them, I was chair of the AHI Suspension Review Committee. We always used to like to call it uh, affectionately the bad committee. Nobody wants to go to it. Nobody wants to appear in front of it. Uh, they don't want to even hear the name. But unfortunately, what will happen during the hockey season is people will accumulate too many minors or they'll accumulate too many game misconducts or the teams will be out of control or a coach will be out of control or God forbid, a team or a member or a coach will receive a match penalty. Unlike your individual clubs that have an r &E that handle everything, USA Hockey requires their affiliates to have two standing committees. They have other standing, but to handle infractions. They divide them between rules and ethics and suspension review. Unlike your club that handles internal problems, money problems, uh, ice problems, coach problems, whatever, all that falls under the umbrella of your rules and ethics. USA Hockey divides it up. Our NE in Illinois handles off ice problems, bullying, uh, coaches maybe hitting somebody at a practice or uh, uh, another kid hitting another kid at a practice, parents fighting in the stands, parents uh, violating zero tolerance with the refs, uh, people that aren't paying their bills and so on and so forth. That's all rules and ethics, and that's chaired by Greg Chudikoff. Suspension review, by definition in USA Hockey, handles only on ice infractions. What normally happens is the chairperson of suspension review will receive every game misconduct that occurs uh, for an Illinois team, whether that be in Illinois, out of state, or out of the country. Everything uh, that involves an Illinois player or coach on ice will be reported uh, to the chairperson of suspension review. The most serious penalty that you could get in hockey is a match penalty. Match penalties. The discipline is discretionary from the Affiliates Commit Suspension Review Committee, other than if you happen to strike a referee. If you strike a referee, they still, up until this day, uh, it goes to the Central District Referee in Chief. She will review it, interview the refs, and she'll certify it for uh, a sanction. Uh, where it is then forwarded to USA Hockey. Uh, that penalty is the only penalty in the book that has a mandatory penalty, a, a suspension of one year for the offender. Now, sometimes what happens is the person doesn't get certified. It turns out it's not as serious as it seems to be. But if it is certified, we have to report 
to the USA Hockey, our findings. And we have to be very careful because uh, USA Hockey is looking for a reason. If we don't give the individual a one-year suspension, they want to know why. And uh, we better back it up. Now, oftentimes we don't and we justify it. And there's a reason maybe, you know, the, the, the kids having problems at home or in life or whatever. Uh, and, you know, we try to make it more of an educational experience than a, a punitive one. The other match penalties could be swinging a stick and hitting the player in the head, back of the leg, uh, shooting a puck at somebody, spinning on somebody, uh, you know, doing something along those lines. Those match penalties, every one is treated as an individual. There are no categories that we lump them into. Even if USA Hockey has some guidelines, we still look at them as an individual. We tend on first offenders, we tend to want to make it more of an educational rather than punitive. We found out that a lot of these young boys and girls that are playing hockey, sometimes this is the only thing in their lives that is keeping them uh, going. Uh, they're, uh, they may have home problems, they may have school problems, they may have all of the above, and while it's keeping them out of the juvenile detention center or later in life, uh, the penitentiary is their experience at youth hockey. Now, we don't do that to the detriment of other players, but we look at each case as an individual case. We try to structure the punishment uh, to uh, fit the crime, so to speak, and educate the player or the coach and uh, go on from there. What we also do is, um, and I just got a, a notification, don't forget abusive official. That's what I just talked about was the year of penalty of abusing an official. But if it didn't re, uh, go to that level, there's also the other uh, categories of abusive official. You know, or you, you call the official a name or, uh, you know, you, you talk about his mother or something along those lines. Um, we're having a hard time keeping officials. We are down drastically in numbers in Illinois and throughout the United States. So the last thing we need is to have some 15 year old kid that's doing this out of, you know, to try and get some extra money being um, blasted by some, you know, 30 year old or 50 year old coach and dressed down or whatever. And um, so the rules are there and we tend to be pretty, especially when it comes to the adult uh, people abusing the officials, we tend to not be so forgiving. If it's a kid, we tend to, uh, again, educate them, find out what the problem is and get into it and, and send them away maybe with a period of probation in addition to so many suspended, you know, games suspended and so on and so forth. The other thing that's becoming very, unfortunately, very prominent uh, on the ice is the religious, racial, and ethnic slurs. Uh, people are using them sometimes even in the wrong context, but nevertheless, they're using them and they're getting called on them and they're getting game misconducts on them. And in some cases, they're getting match penalties on them and they come before the committee. And, uh, and I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but when we have any of these penalties, the chairperson, who is now Jack Weinberg, he will assign this case to one of the members of the committee. We have several people on the committee, all of whom were coaches, refs, players. They bring a broad, many, many years of experience to the table. And almost all of them are parents. So they, they get it. Jack will assign the case to one of these men or women, and they will investigate it. They will call the player, they'll call the coach, they'll call the ref, and they'll prepare a report. And oftentimes what they'll do is they'll, incur, they'll set up a meeting to bring the offending person into a hearing before the suspension review committee. Um, what we also do is, in some cases, and certain penalties, 
we'll look at the player. We'll, we'll talk to the coach. We'll talk to the, maybe the club president, uh, the ref, and say, you know, all right, this player has never been in trouble, never had a game misconduct. This is their first match penalty. Let's see what we can do here. So sometimes what the, we'll do is we'll have the board, your board, conduct an investigation through their harmony and they know the player better they know the coach better they know the family better and they will do their own due diligence do their own hearing and they'll come up and say listen we think we're going to suspend suspend this kid for five games she gets it she knows what's she did wrong she's got her head on straight she's one of our better players one of our better students one of our better representatives of our organization. This was an out-of-body experience. Would you be willing to accept six months probation and a six-game suspension? If we think it's sufficient, we will agree to that and the matter will end without a hearing. Sometimes we have people that are offenders and they demand a hearing. Other times they feel the penalty is too harsh and they come before us for, not us anymore, I keep saying us, they come before suspension review for a hearing. If that happens, then what will occur is the player, uh, the refs don't show, the victim of whatever happened on the ice doesn't appear. It's not a legal proceeding. There is no lawyers allowed. They can come in, but they can't participate. And the person will come in and they'll, basically be asked questions to present their case and tell us what happened. The committee members will ask them what, you know, questions, and then they can present any witnesses they have in support of their situation. Once that's completed, they leave the hearing. The committee deliberates, calls the offending party in, and tells them what the disposition is. Could be time served, it could be additional time be served, it could be probation with time served, many, many combinations. And uh, the parties can either accept that discipline or if they wish, they can file a notice of appeal within 10 days to me and they have to fill other requirements out. And then it, it, I'll assign it to the AHI Appeals Committee to make a determination as to whether the the, the hearing and the disposition was appropriate, but it's taken very serious. Um, a lot of times in the past, when a match penalty come out, we have a, a relatively new president or a president that's never had one. And you'll find out a lot of the coaches never had a player to get one. Uh, when that happens, do not hesitate to call Jack Weinberg, send him an email, drop him a line, make a call, and he will tell you who the investigator is. He will tell you what to expect. Um, usually he'll have you call that investigator and uh, if you hadn't been notified already, and they'll walk you through the process. They don't make, uh, make it tougher on the president just because one of their players or coaches committed an offense. They're there to help you, and they will help you. Uh, I think the, the committee does a, a, a great job. Uh, they handled a lot of penalties in state and out of state with the, uh, even with the COVID. Uh, wasn't as many as it usually is in a year. Uh, just to give you an example, on a weekly basis during the hockey season, it will not be uncommon for the chairperson of rules of suspension and review to get 80, 90, or even 100 game misconducts and possibly three or four match penalties in a week. So it's almost like having a full-time job when you uh, participate on this particular committee. All the game misconducts are reviewed by the chairperson. If there's a pattern, and Jack Roslowski usually keeps stats on who gets the game misconducts, how many they got. There are rules, of course, passed down from USA Hockey that have graduated suspensions because of game misconducts. 
But if we have a team that's out of control, USA Hockey has blessed the suspension review committee with what they call a 410 penalty. And that means that we can contact the team or the bring in the entire organization for disciplinary measures. We have done that in the past with some high school teams that were out of line uh, with penalties, with minors, with game misconducts, with fan base, everything. And um, we have, with the blessing of USA Hockey, actually uh, dismissed, disbanded the organizations. It wasn't something that we were proud of or that we were happy to do, but uh, after two or three warnings and hearings, uh, it had to be done. Uh, most of the time, we can nip it in the bud, get them back on track, and everybody's happy. So I think that kind of sums it up for suspension review. What else do we have, Gretchen? Uh, that was your last slide, Kevin. Okay. Now, uh, are we doing any questions here? Are there any things coming in? Or Absolutely, Kev. So, yeah, if anybody has any questions for Kev or and you want to discuss, you, you, got them, you got them live here. It's a good good chance to ask them or uh, see if we can answer them along the way. So either open your mic and do it or send it in the chat either way. Don't be bashful. Well, see, this is the benefit of having the late shift. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're all ready for bed. <laughs> yep. Well, I thank you all for coming and uh, I look forward to I don't want to sound, you know, giddy, but we and AHI are actually, well, for lack of a better word, we're giddy in anticipation of this next season. Uh, we think it's going to be great. Uh, we, we're hoping to implement a lot of good things, make a lot of changes that will make hockey better for you and for your players. And we're very positive that we're going to have a great season. So I just keep reading about this new Delhi virus that's hit in the United States. And I hope that we're all still alive by August 1st, but it seems like they got that under control too. So it'll be great to be able to go to rinks and watch games and uh, listen to people complain about this or that and ice time and all the good things that we all hear about and have heard about all our lives. So um, keep your chins up. The, the season is going to be next thing you know, it'll be clinics and, and 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 uh, conditioning camps and tryouts and parents writing checks and kids showing up getting their uniforms on in locker rooms and out there playing hockey that's what we're all about so let's keep the positive vibes going and have a great year <laughs>